The idea is that we need to be more and let the doing flow from there. Be yourself, be your authentic self, be here now, you know, be grateful, be present and let the doing flow from those, that orientation is a completely different model that, you know, it's like I, I've, I'm spending my life efforts, I think, working to share that and to help the some of the best doers and thinkers in the world to reorientate what got them good, but is slowing them down from being their absolute personal best. Mm the idea the the framework the psychological framework that i need to do more to be more and that's born out of anxiety flat out and the trick though there is that that got, that'll get people good i need to do more uh -huh. damn i missed that jumper how am i gonna miss that jumper let's keep it like yeah so that's this um you know it's like just enough anxiety will get you good but it will slow you down for being your absolute best at some point. So there's some biological things we can take a look at, and then there's also psychological, right? And then, so it's the interaction of those two. Biologically, our brain, as best as we think, and it's three pounds of silly putty that sits in our skull mm -hmm. that's more complicated than, yeah. you know, like the brightest minds in neuroscience are still amazed by how our brain works. And so, um, but we think that our brain is designed to scan the world and find what's dangerous, right? And so our ancestors passed that gift on to us. Your lineage passed that gift on to you that they were able to survive. And so how survive? Way back in ancient times that they could scan the world and easily discern how to be ready between, uh, now let me say it more, more eloquently. They could scan the world and find uh, what was dangerous or what was threatening so that they wouldn't be eaten. Mm -hmm eaten by the saber-toothed tiger as the story goes right? right so and then so then not only was nature dangerous and all the elements in nature but other humans became dangerous to each other so now what we've created is the ability the heightened ability to read micro expressions and micro expressions are the small squinting of the eyes the frontalis muscles between the eyes and when those squint or don't move it's a sense of threat Mm. right because we don't know what's happening to that from yeah. that person and so if you got this ancient brain that's programmed beautifully to find what's dangerous and we scanned in an undisciplined way our environment around us we're going to find dangerous things yeah and in modern times we're not chased by saber tooths anymore the new modern saber tooth are other people's opinions mm. and so um, we're well conditioned from an early age and this next generation is going to be even more well conditioned, Social you know, media. with Insta yeah. highlight reels for everything. My life is better than yours. I'm going to yeah. show you by, via a snap picture is that, um, you know, so we've got this real challenge that to pursue a, a path of our personal best, we have to override our DNA. That's, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to do. It requires deep commitment to training. Yeah. And that's a psych, that's what psychology, the optimal um, opportunities that psychology offers us is just that how to train our minds to override our DNA and to use the smaller parts of our brain to scan the world and find opportunity mm. not a could I will rattle off as many as you want to sure. hear like tactics and and then I also want to put a small little asterisk next to this is that the tactic alone is not enough right it's the stitching of the tactics it's the stitching of the mental skills training to each other and to one's personal philosophy so without a personal philosophy it's like you we end up just trying all these different things to get better but what are we getting better at what other people want us to be mm -hmm. so there's a fundamental piece of work first <laughs> got it right so what would be your personal philosophy I'll, I'll, I'll share mine cool um it i've spent a lot of time with it and i'll tell I, if i could tell a story of how sure, it worked i think it, it will yeah harden a little bit is that um so I needed a mentor when I was growing up and um, I'm thankful. What's up, Gary? Like I'm thankful for Gary. He helped me out in so many different ways, even currently today. Um, and so one day he says, um, Hey Mike, I, I want to introduce you to my mentor. Oh, great. I didn't know there was such a thing as like a grand mentor. Like, yeah. am I ready? And so you know, it was this moment I said, okay, here we go. And it was this, um, but to my surprise, it was this, um, small, um, you know, two, uh, three bedroom, two bedroom, or three bedroom, two bath home. Um, and it was well manicured and it was this pleasant, like 78, 82 year old woman comes out and I was just so pleasantly surprised. Like, okay, this is going to get good. Cause she just had that sense of wise woman. Mm -hmm. 
And it's the setting that you would imagine. The shag carpet was a little bit long. The drapes were just a little bit, you know, um, uh, you know, outdated. If yeah, you will. Yeah. And so we sat at the table and uh, she's pouring me tea and, and she says, you know, uh, welcome. And so interested to meet you. And then we sat down and she said, so tell me what you're about. And I said, okay, well, um, uh, what, well, the things that I'm most interested, well, okay, let me start this way. And she looked at me and she looked at my mentor and she said, I thought you said he was ready. I said, oh my, I am, I, I, I am ready. Like, wait, 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 no, 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 I want to answer that. And she grabbed my tea and she said, you know, when you're ready, sweetie, I'd like to share this tea with you. Ooh. Yeah. So I was like super embarrassed in that moment. Like I thought I let my, my mentor down and, you know, it was like this really intense experience. Wow. It was right after, it was like 26, 27, somewhere in that range. And so I didn't know what to do. And so it was this awkward moment, but I knew that I had, I was not prepared to even answer the most basic question. Who are you? And so that's where, that's where I just want to anchor that because I think that that captures what most of us feel like a lot. Most people don't feel like they know who they are. Yeah. And so I had this dramatic moment for yeah. me, but you know, I think it's a really important process to go through. So let's call it a personal philosophy, but then let's extract one, one level out from that. The greatest and the most influential people across the globe are very clear about their philosophy. The greatest movers and shakers and change makers are um, spiritual leaders and political leaders for the most part. And now we're starting to see business leaders, yeah. you know, to do that. Um, what was Confucius you know, philosophy? What was Buddha's philosophy? What was Jesus philosophy? They're really clear. Jesus was, and I want to oversimplify a beautiful set of traditions, but Jesus was more about love and service. Buddha was more about, you know, um, that all people are suffering. And then so let's work through compassion to live with loving kindness. What was Martin Luther King Jr.'s? Dr. King Jr.'s was about equality, equality yeah. you know? It, Malcolm X, equality, totally different tone, totally yeah. different approach. Mother Teresa, Helen Keller, what was Helen Keller's? Like, okay, I'm gonna go for it. And like, I deserve to be educated as well. She changed yeah. the educational system. So the most influential people were very clear, why? Because they lined up their thoughts, their words and actions to the thing that matters most to them. And that's what a philosophy is about. Everybody already has one. You have one, I have one. Whether we could articulate it at knife point in a dark alley, totally different yeah. element, right? And so I think that that's a ni nice litmus test. Like, could you get it out in front of a deranged person who's got a knife to your throat? Like, could you, do you, are you that clear what you stand for? And do you have your personal philosophy? So that's the litmus test for, for folks that I work with. And I'll share mine, it's every day is an opportunity to create a living masterpiece. And so there's op, um, there's optimism embedded in there, there's creative juices embedded in there, and then there's you know this idea of uh, a living masterpiece. And so um, when I met Coach Carroll, head coach of the Seattle Seahawks about six years ago, six, seven years ago, one of our first conversations, it was, it was over dinner, a mutual friend put us together, and we had this really wonderful conversation, and it was born out of like, what is your philosophy? So he had been on the same similar journey, I should mm -hmm. say, where he was fired from two head coach jobs yeah. in the NFL. Yeah. And on, on the second time he was fired. So from pain creates change. Mm -hmm. Uncomfortableness is how we grow, but change is how we, uh, I'm sorry, uncomfortableness is how we grow, but pain is why we change. Mm. So he experienced pain and said, if I get another chance, I'm going to do it exactly the way that is authentic to me, but I got to figure out what that is. Well, yeah. So he just went and scratched down on, you know, multiple pads, spiral, you know, old school spiral notebooks, just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, took a second pass at it and said, what are the words that keep showing up? Circled those words, wrote more about those words. And that's how it eventually spilled out of him. His philosophy is always compete.